Uh, you might have heard this before. You might have said this before or something like it or, or seen it, you know, on a movie. She loves me. Pluck. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. And on and on around the daisy we go, plucking petal after petal, where one love-struck person is not quite sure if the one that they have eyes for, have a heart for, is uh, on the same page as they are. Right? The non-romantic person in the room is just going to be super logical about it, which if that's you, you never sat there with a flower pulling petals, to be sure. Well, just count them. If it's, if it's odd, they love you. If it's even, they don't love you. Just move past it. Why all the ritual? Well, it's not really even about that, nor is it about trusting the petals as we work our way around the proverbial flower, right? It's not really the point. There's one starry-eyed individual who's in a dreamy state, just thinking about the one that they love, and wondering whether or not it's mutually um, a mutual love, I think is what I'm trying to say, right? It's not the same, but I, I wonder if there's some similarity even to thinking about Eve in the garden. Where God gave Adam a command and he said, of all of the trees in the garden, you may eat, but of this one... You may not. And then the serpent comes along with his ploy, tempting Eve by appealing to what was already in her heart. Well, did God really say? And then Eve takes God's command to something that God didn't actually command. Well, he said, if you even I touch it. And, and in that moment, if you will, something is going on in Eve's mind and heart that is something like, and Adam's to be fair too, does God love me? Or does God love me not? Does God love me? Or does God love me not? Does God want the best for me as his created child? Or is God fearful that I'll be like God, knowing good and evil, and therefore keeping something good from me? Does God have my best interest at heart? Or is God on a power trip? Is God good? Or should I just try to be God? Love. There's so much that could be said about that word. And in fact, there is so much that is said about that word love. Just in the, 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 the epistle, the letter of 1 John, he uses the word 51 times in its varying forms. As much as anywhere in these short chapters. And they're all positive except for this verse that we're going to read today, these few verses where he gives the negative command. And that just means saying something with the word not, right? Do not do this. That means negative. It doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it's given in the negative. And here's the place where we see do not love. Love not the world. It's called a great negative exhortation, you might think. Do not love the world or the things in the world, which is why I've titled this message, do not love the world or its shiny things. He says it slightly differently, but that's what he's getting at. Don't love the world or its shiny things. Read with me in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. 
Open your Bible there. Uh, 1 John is toward the back, right before uh, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, Jude, Revelation. So in the very, very back of your Bible, it's only a few pages for you. So you might flip past it quite easily. Or on your Bible app, if you've, if you've got that there, I'm reading from the English Standard Version, 1 John 2, 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anything loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world, and the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. This is similar to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 12 when he's saying in verses 1 and 2, I appeal to you, brothers, by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind so that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Paul says, don't be conformed to the world. He goes on to show us how we are to avoid being pressed into the mold. Conformed, C-O-N, the prefix of that word means with. Do not be with the form. Do not be shaped by the pattern of this world. Don't be pressed into that mold, but there is a way out by being transformed by renewing your mind according to the truth of God, which is found only in the Bible. So in a similar way, John's negative command, it's an imperative. I'm going to use the word imperative uh, several times today and the word indicative several times today. So far in 1 John, we've been reading indicatives. We've been reading uh, truth statements from John. He's describing how things are, indicatives. And here we move to the first of a nine or 10 imperatives or commands that we see in the book of 1 John in this letter. And this first command is a negative command. Do not love the world or love not the world or the things in the world. He's been describing what it looks like to walk in the light versus walking in darkness. If the, lover is, if the love of the Father is in you, well, then you're walking in the light. You have open, honest fellowship with the Father as well as with his people. Have you ever watched someone when they are walking in darkness? I mean, John describes walking in darkness. The truth is not in a person when they're walking in darkness. But you, you've observed it. In fact, maybe it's been you at times. It's been all of us at times. But one of the things that often happens when someone is walking in darkness, when they're loving the shiny things of the world, and they're convicted about it from a loving God, is that they are, they are they're isolating themselves. In other words, they pull themselves back from the crowd. You escape the people, you avoid the people that you think are going to try to love you back to what God's ways are. Why? Well, because they're clinging to what they believe will bring the greatest benefit to their life in that moment. There's a belief system war going on in their heart. They believe that what they're doing will bring happiness, will bring joy, will solve some sort of problem that they see in their life. And I don't want to be around the people who are going to tell me otherwise. And yet they often find themselves deluded, fooled, tricked by the enemy's schemes who would put that bait in the water, that, that lure in the water. Picture it, some fishing lures, right? I, I'm going to disappoint some of you who fish quite a bit here, so I'm just going to apologize in advance, but... You know, some of them for different fish and different kinds of water and different bodies of water, right? They're just, they've got their glittery, right? Even if it's just a sticker on top of something, it's glittery and the light hits it and it shines and it sparkles. That's what Satan does for us. He just goes, shoo, pop, and it drips down under the water. And the light of deception shines on it in the darkness, and it looks like, oh, that looks good. 
Ooh, that looks fun. I think I'm going to try that. I think I'm going to have a little bite of that and see where that gets me. Pretty sure that'll get me to good things. Nope. All of a sudden it hurts. All of a sudden now you're not in control. All of a sudden you're being dragged along to some destination that you chose but didn't necessarily think through the full consequences of your choice. Which is why in the middle of this letter to Christians, and that's important to remember, he's, he's writing to the church. He's warning out of love. He's warning the church. Don't love the world. Don't, don't love the world. Listen, back to this idea for a minute of, 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 of someone who, who isolates themselves when they don't want to hear the truth. Proverbs 18 tells us this. Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Somebody who isolates themselves says, I'm getting away from the main crowd because that shiny lure in the water, I want to go for that. Because there's something in their desires. There's something in their, their heart of hearts that represents the will of man. Their desires, their decision-making center where they say, whatever that is, it looks promising. And I believe it. And John's saying, no, no, don't, don't fall for it. Don't fall for it. Over and over again, right? We sometimes place ourselves in an opportunity where we give, uh, we, 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 we set ourselves in situations where we have opportunity to sin. And the sin is waiting right there for us. Now, I want you to notice something. I want you to notice something. What's happened before we've gotten into that situation? Well, we took ourselves to that situation. Oftentimes, oftentimes, we, we innately sort of know there's something I want and I kind of know where I want to go get it or I know where it'll be available to me. So we put ourselves in this situation and it just, it just affirms. I had a friend of me say one time, said, you know, before a certain decision is made, many, many, many decisions are made before you ever get to that point. I thought, boy, that is so true. Many decisions are made before you actually get to that moment of opportunity. It was, I just, uh, it was just there. So, so I ate. I drank, I looked, I touched, I cut, I bought. I treasured, fill in the blank, I I think this is one of the reasons that God gives us these really vivid illustrations that sort of shock us, right? Like Proverbs 26, 11, like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Now it's not mean to tell someone you're acting foolishly. It can be mean and it can be sinful, but it also can be godly to say you're being a fool right now. That decision is foolish. It's the word the Bible uses. You can be arrogant about it, which is very sinful and wrong, but you can be humble and honest and loving. I saw this a couple weeks ago in our backyard with our dog who has not gotten sick very often, but did. And I'll spare you the details, but I almost vomited <laughs> watching our dog vomit and then go back and eat it. I mean, why would you put something back in you that obviously just communicated to your body, I want out, right? And you're like, oh no, let's go lick that up. Why would you put yourself in a situation, friend, that has hurt you before? Where you have experienced grave consequences? And you tell yourself, that thing, that temptation, which is already proven to be dire with consequences, unhelpful, hurtful to you and to others. And somehow we say, no, I think it'll be different this time. Let's go lap it up. James gives us the answer. Each person is tempted when he's lured away and he's enticed by his own desire. And then desire, when it's conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. And so John is warning believers about this. 
Essentially, he's saying, choose your love and love your choice. Choose your love and love your choice. Basically, I'm going to spend the whole sermon on the first part of that sentence. Choose your love. The world or the father. Now, he uses the word world here, cosmos, to, to refer to the world system. We use the word world to refer to God's beautiful creation. So he's not talking about those things of the world which are given by God as good gifts, which are beautiful and which are to be enjoyed uh, by his children. That's not the, the use of this word world. They use the, the word cosmos, right? If you think about it, we... we um, this isn't my illustration, so don't get mad at me, ladies, but uh, talking about the idea of bringing order to things, right? We think about the word cosmetics. <laughs> I've seen two of you laugh and the rest of you don't hate me right now. It's just a joke. But when God brought order after he created everything and he brings order in the world. God created the heavens and the earth and he brings order from that which he had created and he brings order to it quite quickly. And so this world cosmos actually has to do with the world system. The, the, the belief system of the evil organized or unorganized system under Satan, which operates through unbelieving people who are God's enemies. He says just in a couple chapters, three chapters later in this very same letter, we know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. He's talking about those who are not under in the, in the, in the kingdom of God, who are not operating according to God's standard, who are, who are not op operating according to the way that, that God would have them operate. Jesus speaks of the world system, those, uh, the world system hating him and hating those who follow him, right? It, it's, 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 it's the enemy, the devil, and, and people in the world who operate on the basis of ungodly thoughts, ungodly attitudes, ungodly motives, values, and goals, which are all below or beneath and contrary to God's ways and God's thoughts, God's plans, God's purposes. The world system seeks to promote a person's glory rather than God's glory. Toward the end of Joshua's life, and I'm going to hit some things pretty quickly here, but toward the end of Joshua's life, he, he's leading the nation of Israel to renew their covenant commitment to the Lord. Uh, but he does so by doing at least three things as God's leader in that time. Even the list I'm going to give you now, you could probably break down into four. In Joshua chapter 24, he recounts God's faithfulness. We were talking about this in Sunday school at the teens this morning about the Passover. He's recounting God's faithfulness to their ancestors and personally in their generations. He's talking about things that God has done to their fathers and their father's fathers, but he even uses the phrase, and your eyes have seen. He gets very personal with them. Your eyes have seen. Christian, I want to ask you today, what have your eyes seen? about the faithfulness of God? How have you seen God work and prove himself to be strong to save? How have you seen God redeem you from the pit? As we read in our call to worship this morning, how have you seen God change your own life? Maybe your spouse's life, maybe your children's lives. What have you seen with your own eyes that remind you to say, God is good and God has done all these things. So Joshua commands them, fear the Lord, and serve him in sincerity and faithfulness. In other words, very much like our vision statement, wholeheartedly. He's communicating to the Israelites, there is no place for half-hearted followers of the Lord here. Commit yourself to the Lord. Then he brings them to a point of decision and he leads by example. That's what he does. Listen to uh, 24 verse 15. We'll look at some other verses in a few minutes. He says, and if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord. Whoa, that's an interesting phrase. You going to serve the Lord? If it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you'll serve. Whether it's going to be the gods of your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites. We often... Uh, 
Use this phrase, choose this day whom you will serve, but as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. That second part comes later in this verse. But when he says, choose this day whom you'll serve, he's saying, what God you want? Lowercase g. What misery do you want? What failure do you want? What temporary pleasure do you want that will not last for the long haul? What pleasure do you want? What lowercase g little God do you want that will make you an enemy of the one true almighty God? Pick. Here's your smorgasbord. Me, my house, we're going to serve the Lord. John's used this word father to describe God. He's used this word children to describe Christians. And in the same way, very similar to how Joshua did it, John focuses our motivation on the most important truth. It's the Father's love first for us that motivates us to love him in response. We see this in just a couple chapters in in chapter 4, 1 John 4. I'm not going to go into it now, but we will see it if you're curious. Read it this afternoon. But in light of the Father's great love in sending his own son to be the propitiation or, or sin sacrifice, atoning sacrifice for our sins and adopting us as children, loving him should be our greatest delight and joy. That doesn't mean we're going to do it perfectly every time. Recently, I sat just thinking about these things in life that just seemed unfair to me. These things in life that just sat wrong with me. These things in life that irritated me. And part of my thought process. You remember last week or the week before I used the illustration of football? When I was playing football in high school, we'd have to, on game day, we'd have to carry this football around with us. Uh, every player did, and we'd have to guard it, right? And people would kind of, they knew that, right? They'd come by, they'd try to kick it out of your hand, you're gardening it, right? We do that with our sin sometimes. Well, I was doing this with my sin. I was having a little pity party, right? Licking up the vomit on the ground. Guarding it. Feeling sorry for myself. And do you know, I want you to hear this, brothers and sisters. Do you know that everything I thought of to defend why I was feeling the way I was feeling came down to a desire to cling to the world system? In each instance I thought of, I thought, why would God, God, why did you? In every instance, and I mean every, the Spirit was like, oh, I'm changing you. Well, yeah, but I don't, seriously, can we do this another day? Year. I'm shaping you to be like my son. Well, yeah, but he, that's right, I haven't yet given myself to obedience to the point of death. Okay. And on and on it went. For hours, friends, hours. And I just sat there. I walked around and I thought these things. And then the Holy Spirit in his kindness just crashed through. And took me to thoughts that I already knew and brought me to a point of decision. What's it going to be? Like, seriously, how long are we going to do this? I will wait for you. I will wait for you. Through the storm and through the fire, I think. What is it? Night. Night. Way to go, pastor's kid. All right. (laughs) Through the storm and through the night. I knew it was an I sound. When, when God addresses his people, it is significant that he addresses us and he leads us to consider our affections, to consider our hearts, right? The greatest commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Solomon wrote, watch over your heart or guard your heart with all diligence for from it, your heart, your affections, your loves spring, flow the springs of life. Listen to Jonathan Edwards. He wrote, uh, 
If you ever get a chance to read it, it takes some work, but it's good. It's good reading. A treatise on religious affections. He says, true religion in part consists of holy affections, holy loves. If your heart is cold toward the father and captivated by the glitz of the world, you need to ask yourself, do I belong to the father or do I belong to the world? We're not saying, do you ever sin? Every one of us in here sins or we wouldn't need a redeemer. We do. His name is Jesus and he's very kind. He's gracious and he's patient. But he warns us all along the way. Don't love the world system or the shiny things in the world. Choose your love. Either you love the world or you love the father. You cannot have both in any enduring sense. Just like in the days of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, down through Joshua, so to us today, God is jealous over his people. This is a good, righteous, perfect jealousy. Not a, not a fleeting jealousy of someone who just wants control in their whole world. No, this is a God who knows what is best for his people and then commands it from us. The best thing for every one of us in this room is to love God with our whole hearts. You will not find a better solution on this earth. You will not find a better solution. Love God with your whole heart. He's telling us that love of the father is incompatible with love of the world. Now listen to how Joshua continues in verses 19 through 24. And we could read all the way through 29, but we're going to just stop there. Joshua said to the people, you're not able to serve the Lord for he is a holy God. Now this is after he said, choose this day who we will serve as, as for me and my house, I will serve the Lord. And they're like, yes, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. He's not like, hang on. I know you're all excited right now, but listen, you're not able to serve the Lord. Wait, what? For he is a jealous God. He is a holy God, a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions of your sins or your, yeah, your transgressions or your sins. If you forsake the Lord and you serve foreign gods, then he will turn and he will do harm and he will consume you after having done you good. And the people said to Joshua, no, but we will serve the Lord. And Joshua said to the people. So here we are, right? Choose this day. Who is it going to be? You want to serve those, those gods or those gods? Or me and my house, we're serving the Lord. Who's on board? Oh, we're on board. Hold on. Hold on. You need to consider yourself before you make this commitment. You need to consider this. I was thinking about that song earlier this morning. I will wait for you. I will wait for you through the storm and through that night. I will wait for you. I will wait for you. Because I know you'll give me everything that I want. Oh, no, no, no. For your love is my delight. Some songs ought to come with a warning label before we sing them. Because that song is both a, a prayer and a, an affirmation of what is true. We're preaching to ourselves when we sing, I will wait for you, Lord. And Joshua is saying, hold on. And they're saying, but we will serve the Lord. And, and then Joshua says, okay. You're a witness against yourselves and that you have chosen the Lord to serve him. And they said, we are witnesses. And he said, then put away the foreign gods that are among you. Incline your heart to the Lord, the God of Israel. And the people say to Joshua, the Lord, our God, we will serve. It's like, they're like, you know, the expression, they're doubling down. They're like quadrupling down right now. The Lord, our God, we will serve and his voice, we will obey. There is a moment often in sharing the gospel and talking with people about the Lord where I almost pause. And sometimes I feel like I just want to back the the conversation again and say, now listen, you're dealing with some pretty significant struggles in your life. And you need to know that those struggles are likely not going to be fixed tomorrow. Even if you trust the Lord today, your financial problems won't be solved. Your relational problems aren't immediately fixed. The challenges you're dealing with are intended by God to refine you, to shape you. So don't 
Don't say, I want to pray to receive Christ right now if you're doing it to solve these problems. There's one problem we're after right now. Your heart, your soul. If we take care of, and by we, I mean the God, the problem in your soul, God will begin to show you how he wants to use the rest of these things in your life to shape you, to make you more and more like him. So Joshua is saying, you can't have both. John is saying, you can't have both because God is righteously jealous for your love. If you say you're going to serve him and you're going to turn, you become his enemy. Is that what you want? Is that the commitment you're making? Are you choosing the love of the father and committing to that love? Choose your love and love your choice. So he is saying here in verses 16, all that's in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes and the pride of life. This is a category. These are categories that he's talking about here, right? The the desires of the flesh appeal to our appetites, right? This desires, uh, epithumia means cravings, lust, passion, desires. It's a natural word. word. You You can have godly desires, godly passions, godly lust, or you can have sinful, all of those things. In other words, you can have a godly desire to, to, to be successful in your career. You can have an ungodly desire to be successful in your career. You can have a godly desire to pastor. You can have an ungodly desire to pastor. I've experienced both personally in my own heart, ungodly motivations in my heart at seasons of my ministry. The desires of the flesh, they appeal to our appetites. Wrong sexual desire gives way to Immorality, a physical desire for food that goes outside of the bounds of what God intends gives way to gluttony. We give in to our flesh because we're sinful people. And he's warning us, don't desire the flesh, the things of the flesh. He's not saying don't meet the God-given needs of the flesh or even the God-given desires of the flesh. But don't let them become your God, your, your idol. The desires of the eyes, right? The desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes appeal to our affections. The things that, 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 that we love that, that look shiny to us. That's why I use that word in the title. Don't love the world or the shiny things of the world. It's... Things that we see that are good and beautiful. Creation. Oh, it's wonderful. It's good. We see it. It's beautiful. We love it. It can even be healing in a sense. I've said this before, but I don't know, three or four years ago, we were driving out west to Sherilyn's family family reunion, and we were driving through uh, several sections of the country on our way out west, and there were times I just was like, well, in tears because of the beauty of God's creation, which reminded me of how big God was. We were going through some things at that time as a church, and God reminded me how big he is. There's nothing that's too hard for God. Absolutely nothing. I just want to ask you, friend, is there something in your life that you think is too big for God? Answer the question. Is, is there something in your life? The answer is probably yes for most of us. We know it in theory. That'd be the wrong answer. But by your decision making, by your choices, by your patterns, by your habits, by your schedule, by your checkbook, by your relationships, by your fears, by your worries, by your choices, by your hiding, through your isolating, is there something in your life that you functionally believe is too big for God? Beware of the schemes of the devil. 
Your job is not to say, our job is not to say, God is big enough. I got it. No. In James, in Peter, he tells us, what are we to do? Stand. In the strength of the Lord. And having done all, to stand. Stand firm. And he goes into speaking about the armor of God. This is why... uh, well, let me read a Proverbs, Proverbs 20, 12. It says, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord made them both. There are windows into the mind. There are windows into the, to the soul, if you will. That's why Jesus said, you've heard that it said, don't commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Right? Does that mean I've already sinned, so I might as well go all the way? Absolutely not. But it does mean be aware of where the temptation is where the sin gives birth to sin and then gives birth to death begins. It begins with the appeal to our affections, the things that we love and that we want and we desire and we give into. David's eyes for Bathsheba. Gave into a trail of decisions where he would commit murder. You could go even further back and say he wasn't out front with his men. I mean, but three, the pride of life refers to our ambitions, our ambitions. Good ambitions are from God when they align with his word. In other words, God has given us the ability to work so that we can provide for our families and so that we can take part in meeting the needs of others. Right? That's why in, in, uh, toward the end of Ephesians, he's saying, let the thief no longer steal, but let him work. Why work? So that he might have something else to give to someone that's in need. You might expect the Lord there to say, or Paul there to say, let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor doing honest work with his hands so that he might have enough to provide for himself. No, more than that, so that he has more things to give to others. In other words, stop focusing on only meeting your own needs, but focus on doing what God gave you to do with the strength he gave you for godly motives to love and serve others. Our ambitions are to build God's kingdom. Never our own. Boy, that can be really deceitful. I want to be a good hard worker. I want to be the example. Or... I've worked in this position long enough. It's time to move up. Now, none of those things I said right there are wrong. They can be godly. They can be ungodly. Some might say, well, you know, alcohol has done so much more harm in this world. And so I'm not going to drink. I'm so Christ-like. Ding. That was like, you know, in the commercials. They... What's the point? I've just sinned in what may have started out as a good desire to bring glory to God with my life and my choices. You see how easy it is? And so with uh, 125 or 30 of us in this room, we might look around and go, oh, what are all of the things? There's all the things. Well, here's the deal, friends. You know what your thing is. You know what the glitz and the glitter is that you're after. I want to ask you something. What is it that you want that you think will make you happy? And what do you do if you don't get it? When Sherilyn and I get into arguments, that's happened once or twice. Um, Thank you. Sherilyn's a processor. If she's not here to defend herself, so I can say whatever I want right now. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Better be careful. Lots of accountability right now. Sherilyn likes to step back from the conversation. She desires not to say things that she's going to regret. So she'd rather take a beat, take a minute, think through things, and... Then circle, she could work on the circle back part, but I want to reconcile now. 
And so like I'm an attacker, like, right? I kind of, I don't mean I attack her, but I mean, I go after reconciliation. She's like, I need to think through this. I'm like, why do you need to think through this? We've already talked about it. It's all good now. So like get with the program and let's be fine. Okay, okay, I'm fine. A godly desire for reconciliation can turn into a sinful desire for me to feel better about our relationship because I am insecure. Here, a subtle form of pride in my relationship with the Lord and his work in her heart to trust her to do the work that she needs to do so that I can just sit back and rest in the Lord and say, Lord, I think, I think I've done the part that you've called me to do here and now I'm going to wait. I will wait for you. I will wait for you. Will you? Through the storm, through the night. Why? Because God's love and the way God loves his people is more desirous to me than anything. I want you to listen to a quote from A.W. Tozer. There is within the human heart a tough, fibrous root of all fallen life whose nature is to possess, always to possess. It covets things with a deep and fierce passion. The pronouns my and mine, which start in the nursery. Oh, wait, he didn't say that here. My and mine, they look innocent enough in print, but their constant and universal use is significant. They express the real nature of the old Adamic man better than a thousand volumes of theology could ever do. Oh, how true that is. They use their verbal symptoms of our deep disease. The roots of our hearts have grown down into things and we dare not pull up one rootless lest we die. Things become necessary to us, a development never originally intended. God's gifts now take the place of God. And the whole course of nature is upset by the monstrous substitution. Things of the world, things of the Father. The focus is on me. Things of the world, things of the Father, the focus is on God. Things of the world make as much money as possible. Things of the Father, give away as much money as possible and spend even less on yourself. Things of the world, live comfortably. Things of the Father, life is not about comfort, but about doing hard things now so that we can reap the rewards in the life to come. Things of the world, make a name for yourself. Things of the Father, make his name great. Do whatever makes you happiest. Do whatever makes God happiest. Teach your children to love themselves and seek self-fulfillment. Teach your children to love and obey God. Offer acts of service when you feel like it, on your own terms, when it makes you feel better about yourself. Be a servant, even or especially when it's uncomfortable and inconvenient. Stay married as long as your spouse meets your needs. Serve the spouse in the way that Christ modeled servanthood and choose to love him or her for life. Come across as powerful, influential, or interesting, secure, confident. Give pressure to others in words and actions. Use worldly wisdom to accrue wealth. Value true wisdom. The fear of God over all the treasures on the earth. Things of the world, they're passing away. The things of the Father abide forever. I'll do the will of the world. to make others happy. I'll do the will of the Father to make my Father happy. Choose your love. In closing, the second point, love your choice. In other words, you might be asking yourself, well, what if I don't love my choice afterwards? Oh, no. No, you're, you're asking, what if I don't feel good about my choice afterward? I'm saying, love your choice. 
commit. Commit. Love the Father? Commit to it. In the Old Testament, idolatry, foreign gods, was never seen as something that you could just stash in the storage room. You couldn't hang on to the other gods because the other gods were enticing. You couldn't live with the people of the other lands because their lifestyle was too enticing. Right? Now, John, John's not arguing that we actually escape from the world in a monastic sense. He's saying, commit wholeheartedly to your choice. Don't love the world or its things because it's passing away. Love the Father. How do you know you love the Father? Because in God's mercy, you've committed to the Father. You make decisions according to the ways of the Father. And we see that in Jesus. Time and again, he was ridiculed. He was mocked. He was beaten. He was made fun of. And his disciples were. And we will too. Choose your love. And love your choice because it has eternal consequences. And this is why God gives us ways to remember. This is why we come to the Lord's table week in, week out to eat of this unleavened bread, which reminds us all the way back to the days when the Israelites had to we were talking about in Sunday school this morning. They had to had their sandals on and their belts ready, and they had to bake unleavened bread. Like he was like, get rid of all of the leaven in the house, get rid of it all, for these seven days, just leave, just unleavened bread. Why? Because you're gonna have to move fast. And all the way down through, we have seen how God redeemed His people from Egypt. We've seen how God redeemed his people time and again. But even like Joshua said to the Israelites, you too, you've seen it with your own eyes. Love him. Commit. It's worth your eternity. So we remember and maybe you say, there are ways that I'm not committing well right now. You don't have a God standing over you ready to make you feel like a dirt bag. You have a God standing with you who says, it's okay, I've done it before. Let's get going again. Come on, stand up. Give me your burdens and let's walk together. And he did that by choosing the glory of the Father at the cross. And if you say, I've committed to him, renouncing self and trusting in his grace, come, eat, drink, worship. If you're not sure, oh, use this as a time to pray. I'd love to talk with you. Anybody that you know here would love to talk with you. We don't ever want to pressure anybody. We just want to be a friend who can talk to you about our friend and our Savior in Christ. Let's worship him together now.